Manchester. Panel of political strategists this afternoon. Graeme Morris and Bruce Hawker, a very good afternoon to you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I want to get your thoughts on the latest opinion poll out today. Malcolm Turnbull, of course, famously said Tony Abbott had to go after losing 30 on the trot. He's now been behind for 13. Not quite halfway there, but Graeme Morris, uh, what do you make of the numbers today? They haven't budged over the last couple of weeks. Well, well, they, they haven't, and that's quite the extraordinary thing. I've got something in my ear. <laughs> well, try and fix that while you keep um, talking. It, it is quite extraordinary that it's just fixed. You know, the, the, the Labor Party is well in front of the coalition, and that's been steady for a while, and the Prime Minister is way in front of the opposition leader, and that's been fixed for a while, and the independents and the, uh, the minor parties are still, still going well. Look, uh, yeah, I, I think there were quite a few people who thought with that budget that there would be a bit of movement. But a lot of the hard heads, I think, are saying, look, it's been entrenched for quite a while. It's going to take either a dramatic shock or just a steady climb to get back um, to sort of somewhere near one, where one could win an election. But here's the thing, Graham. I mean, how long does it take? I mean, is there any sense of how long the government needs to wait? Because there is a big shift in this budget. It, it, there was a big shift, but it was one of those sort of budgets that people say, uh, oh, yeah, there's some headlines there that said Mr Turnbull's doing something a bit different. But it wasn't a lot in it for them. You know, there weren't all the tax scales where people look up and say, hey, I'm going to be, you know, 20 bucks a week better off. That sort of stuff wasn't there. It, but it, it, I, I think what, what it's done is that it's neutralised a lot of the attack weapons that the opposition had to belt the Prime Minister, the Treasurer and the Government around the ears. Mm -hmm. That was step one. And they've done that. Yeah, so a, a, a defensive uh, move to try and get rid of some of those problems. Yeah. Bruce, what do you think, though? Are you uh, surprised at all by the numbers today? Uh, not really. I think for some time he's just been uh, you know, in, in the gutter, really, and, and the electorate has sent him there. I, I think they've made up their mind about Turnbull. They don't like him. And uh, I think it's largely because of the way in which he's conducted himself in the past. And this latest budget really probably adds to the confusion somewhat. You know, one minute he's progressive, then he's conservative, then he's progressive again. Um, probably disturbs the electorate, and I suspect that it disturbs his backbench as well, because with numbers like that, 53 to 47, uh, a lot of the caucus are going to go back to their constituencies in the winter break, which is coming up, and they're going to say to themselves, well, uh, have I got a future here with Turnbull or have I got a, uh, a rendezvous with a very unhappy electorate in a couple of years' time? That's the sort of thing that he's going to have to uh, deal with and I think it's going to be very hard for him. Now, you can say Shorten's numbers are, uh, are lower than his, but, you know, the overall vote is what counts here and 53-47 is a bad number for the government. I mean, look, the, the general um, consensus, I suppose, coming out of the budget has been that this is a fairness budget. Labor's then tried to go even further with even more money for schools, not supporting a Medicare levy increase on those earning up to 87 grand and so on. But, but Labor had gone way too far out on the left flank in response to this. But if the numbers are holding up pretty well for Labor, um, uh, you know, 53, 47, maybe, maybe Labor's got it right. Graham, maybe people want to go even further in that fairness direction. Yeah, look, it, it's it, it's not their approach to the budget. It's just that the the you know the government is coming off a, a very ordinary six months or so. Yeah. This budget was a stopper, um, and and but also you know I, I take Bruce's point that the you know the, the the party vote is is terrible, but so too is Mr. Shorten's. And, you know, you talk about, you know, what's going to happen Mr Turnbull, you, but you could smell this month that already some in the Labor Party are starting to say, well, look, you, we, we can win this, but we're not quite sure that Bill's the man. Now, they're a long way away from doing anything about that, but there were some rumblings this month that we haven't seen yet. Well, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see. But I think if he's ahead 53-47, uh, it'll be hard-pressed to mount a 
amount of push against him. Uh, the budget debate itself, yeah, the budget debate itself, the school uh, funding deals being um, introduced to the House, it'll, it'll go through there. Uh, and we'll see where that ends up. The bank tax, apparently we'll find out, I'm told, Wednesday what the legislation involves. Uh, there's still a lot of moving pieces in all of this, but uh, from what you've seen of the debate, Graham, how confident are you the major measures will actually get through the Parliament? Uh, uh, look, I think they will, but they may be slightly tweaked. And, again, I think the main player... People forget this. The main player um, is going to be the Finance Minister, Matthias Cormann, who who somehow or other has... He's built this trust with the cross branches and, and seems to be able to, to come up with some arrangements that everybody is happy with. But, you know, it all depends whether the Labor Party really wants to oppose some of these measures that used to be their policy. If they do, the independents come into play. If not, then it's all over. It just goes through. A couple of other issues away from uh, all of that. Afghanistan, we're sending a further 30 trainers in there to help train, uh, advise and assist the Afghan uh, forces. Bruce, it is again a reminder that we've been there a very long time. Admittedly, we've stopped and started a bit throughout mm. uh, the last 16, 17 years, mm. uh, but we're going to be there for a very long time still. Yeah, I think we are. And I think this is a sad story about the Middle East and about the, the world as it stands at the moment. Any thought that we're going to be able to just walk away from it all is forlorn uh, and, and hopeless, really. Uh, they're increasing the numbers by 30 to, I think, 300. And uh, that'll be mainly for training exercises or exclusively for training. Um, interestingly, I, I travelled Tarrant Cout once very briefly with Kevin Rudd when he was Prime Minister, and I remember speaking to one of the soldiers there who said that the biggest thing that was actually building morale in the community in Afghanistan was the fact that they had television programs which sort of approached something that we apparently enjoy in the West, you know. It wasn't quite Afghanistan has talent, but it was those sorts of programs that were seeing the world in a, in, a, in a different way, and that was doing more to build up uh, support for the government than, than anything else. So, you know, it is going to be a very difficult uh, process for them to hold out the Taliban in the longer term because that's the way in which history tends to have been written in in Afghanistan, but uh, they've got to stay there. They've got to stay the course. There was a time, of course, when the, uh, the, the Americans and the Australians were pretty much out of Afghanistan altogether. Of course, uh, they got themselves caught up in Iraq, which was you know, creating an even bigger mess. Um, so I think they'll come and go in greater and smaller numbers, but I can't see this ending in my lifetime, and I hope to live for a long well, time. Yeah, well... <laughs> well, we do, we hope so too. But, Graham, this is the thing. Some say, uh, given the nature of the threat, we should be sending in more than uh, just 30. What political no, look, support we're, would we're, there be for that, though? We're, we're, we're sending in, essentially, an extra platoon. Now, I, I, I actually think there must be a way where the government can explain what they're doing apart from their training. Now, you, you can't tell everybody everything that they're doing, I understand that, but there, there should be some sort of a speech soon which just details a bit more what these Australians are doing. What, what is this training thing that they're doing? Are we just having exercise and we're teaching them, you know, how to, how to do building-to-building -building fighting? Is it, is it we're teaching them how to handle weapons? Is it teaching, you know, medical stuff in the field? I don't know. But I think it is nearly time that the Australian government said this is, and the Defence Minister, this is what they're doing. Well, we'd love to be able to go over and tell the story about what we're doing, just saying. Uh, we'll, we'll hopefully be able to do that at some point. Final one, Indigenous recognition. Uh, well, <laughs> tell me why you groan. Uh, look, I, I, this is really disappointing. Somehow or other, the Indigenous people went to Uluru and blew up the reconciliation process. All of those millions that were spent, that army of people who were supposedly running that big R and controlling this agenda, the people at Uluru said, no, put it in the bin. And, and I have helped run the last three no cases at referendums. Um, this one would be even worse. Just imagine the no case here. 
You know, uh, it'd be something like Australians already spend billions on 400,000 Indigenous Australians. Do you want to spend a lot more so that there can be an election and people have an extra more power than you do in influence in the government? Do you really want a treaty? Should we have treaty? There were 500 odd clans of Indigenous people. Do we have treaties with 500 if we can find them? You know, and, and it, it comes down when in doubt, just vote no. This one is very, very untidy and, and we had got to the stage where reconciliation was about to be accepted and they've blown it up. This is not necessarily where it ends up. Uh, the Referendum Council has to have a good look at all of this and then make a recommendation to government. But, Bruce, do you share concerns that this has blown it up? Uh, I'm, I am worried about it now. I, I think it, was always, it always will be a very tough one uh, to get uh, through in a, in a referendum because, you know, it only requires, um, a, well, it requires three, uh, a majority uh, of states and a majority of citizens, and we know the record is very poor, so, in getting these things passed. So, the, uh, the unless you set the bar quite low, um, then the prospects of somebody coming along and running a big no campaign or not getting bipartisan support for the proposition uh, increase and, therefore, the prospects of losing anything happen, uh, it become much greater. So I, I think it, this is going to add to some sense of confusion in the Australian electorate. I suspect they won't like the idea of this representative body, although it sounds very much like an ATSIC-style uh, body that we've seen in the past operating in Australia without the sky falling in. But uh, it only takes a small amount of, dis uh, of uncertainty about what is intended in the referendum for a, a strong no vote to be garnered. You know, so treaties, that sort of thing, uh, you know, increasing legal rights out of the constitution so, so what, will be a problem. What, what would pass? I mean, the, the two of you have a, good, have a good read on, you know, public mood, what can be achieved at a referendum and so on. What, I mean, if we look at something minimalist that could uh, achieve um, success at a referendum, what would it be? Well, unfortunately, it would probably be something rather anodyne, like just recognising the former custodianship of the, of the land by uh, Aboriginal people and little more than that, which seems to me essentially to be a constitutional en enactment of Mabo, uh, which now yeah. is the law anyway. The, yeah. I, I don't... See... This is the... This is the uh, this is this is the point where you say former custodianship, you know, yeah. and the, the point that they they make repeatedly is that they've never ceded um, uh, their sovereignty mm. over the land. Yeah. Um, th this is not former. This is this is right. And now. and that's good. That's good. People people were, were getting to the stage where they would accept that. But the idea that our constitution becomes a sort of a, a sorry document. Australians are not going to wear at all, not even close in, in, in a referendum if they put these propositions up, and that is terrible from where we've been in the last, in the last, last year or so. We were getting close. Can I just right. say this? Well, it we'll might, it can I, can yeah, I say quickly, just quickly? It just might be that that's part of the thinking behind the meeting in Uluru, that, that they don't really expect to see uh, a great results out of the constitutional debate or out of a referendum, so they go for something else. So this representative body. Uh, that might be part and parcel of their thinking, and, and as such, maybe that's outside not the silliest the thing. Yeah, outside the yeah. Constitution. Hmm. All right, we've got to go. We'll see you both next week. Bruce Hawker, Graham Morris, thank you. Yeah, David. We'll take a quick break. Back with the last word.